looking at Father's Day, I, I'm always curious when I when we look at holidays, what some of their origins are, and I'll only spend a couple minutes. I don't know if you know the story behind Father's Day, how it came about. It was actually uh, was started by a woman, a uh, lady named Sonora Dodd, who was in Spokane, Washington in the early 1900s, around 1910. And uh, she was listening to a sermon on Mother's Day. And as she thought about it, she really felt like that they should do something for fathers. Because the story is, her father, who was a Civil War veteran, um, his wife died when they were having their sixth child in childbirth. So here you have this man who's left with a newborn and five children to raise in the 1900s on his own. And he did exactly that to the best that he could. He wasn't perfect in any respect. But she looked back on the servant heart that he had and what he displayed in his life and just trying to raise them with what he had, with where he was. And she felt like that he should be honored in that. And so... Um, she went to the people in her church, and they couldn't do it that the, the Sunday of his birthday, which was June 5th, 1910. They did it a few weeks later. And then somebody got word to the president at that time, which was, I believe it was uh, Calvin Coolidge, who said that uh, um, we should really honor that day. And so they established that as a national day, and then it was actually L LBJ who actually made it a true holiday that we would honor fathers on the third Sunday of June, simply for being fathers. Now, it's interesting when you look at our culture today that um, not a lot of fathers around. When you look at statistics about, you know, the most prevalent or most significant factor in crime is not about race or religious background or money or financial status. It's the presence or lack of a father in the home. And so we live in a culture where fatherhood isn't necessarily esteemed and isn't necessarily honored in a way, but at least we haven't done away with the holiday uh, to honor them. And I realize today as well, when we talk about fathers, some of you are fathers, some of you, your father is no longer with us like myself, or some people, the memory of fathers is not always so pleasant. But I hope this morning as we talk about some things that even still as we sang, this is really, there's only one good example of a father, and that was God the Father. And hopefully as we go through this, we'll see some things that are helpful. Now, it's interesting, I, I want to, uh, I, I'd like to hear from you. Um, many times growing up, our fathers would say something or they would do something in a certain way that has stuck with us. Maybe it was a saying, maybe it was a phrase or something like that. And I'm going to read you a few that I came across. And I'm curious to hear if any of you have something about your father, something your father used to say all the time that has just sort of stuck with you uh, since your you know, childhood or whenever. These are some of the ones that I read which are kind of interesting. One person's father says, the man on the top of the mountain didn't fall there. The second one is, never underestimate the power of human stupidity. <laughs> I love this one. Marry a big woman, someone to give you shade in the summer and warmth in the winter. <laughs> Always throw away the box when you take the last piece of candy. Honesty is like a trail. Once you get off it, you realize you're lost. Wherever you are in life, make friends with the cook. I like that. Don't shake the tree too hard. You'll never know what might fall out. One we all have heard, measured twice, cut once. The second time you get kicked in the head by a mule, it's not a learning experience. <laughs> you need to do what you have to do before you do what you want to do. Well, you know what happens when you wrestle with pigs. You get all dirty and they love it. <laughs> if you don't need it, don't buy it. If it's the worst thing that happens in your life, don't worry about it. Successful people make a habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Don't let your studies interfere with your education. <laughs> don't be foolish just because you know how. <laughs> this is one that I, I don't say, but my kids would say, Cheryl tells our kids all the time, you have to eat, eat an elephant in small bites. Do you know what happened when I found all the answers? They changed all the questions. The last one I ran across, if everybody else is doing it, it's probably wrong. Now, those are just words that people heard, but I'm curious. What did some of your fathers say that you remember? 
It doesn't have to be that profound. Just curious. My dad said that uh, I don't care if you're a blankety blank dick digger, you better be the best blankety blank dick digger there. All right. And that's, that's I would think I was 14. It's <laughs> good. Stuck. Anybody else? Just relax. That's good. Nick. No, and the job's done well enough. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Very true. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good dip. <laughs> Say again. Forget everything else. Just pay your mortgage. Just. <laughs> <laughs> something to cry about. Yeah, that's right. We all heard that one, yeah. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. My father always said, I know what you're doing, because I know who you're walking with. That's right. That's good. Anybody else? Ask your mother. Ask your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Ask your mother. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We all heard that a lot. Something about you catch more bees with honey than vinegar. Oh, yeah. That's not the way I heard it. No, I can't say that. That's right. It's the clean version. My father was a, was a man of few words. He didn't talk a lot. He was a very busy man. He worked for the railroad. And so uh, a lot of my members as a kid were always working with him or doing things with him. And we, we raised horses. We had horses really for our pleasure. But um, one time I was always, some of the things my father did, when I look back, I always kind of thought as a kid, what in the world was he thinking or is he thinking? Because we would do things the hard way. And I knew that in looking back, he, many times we did it the hard way because he was trying to teach me something. He just didn't know how to articulate that very well. I'll give you an example. We had horses, and sometimes horses can be somewhat spirited, and they don't want to obey or do what you want. And so he used to take out this thing. He called it a twitch. And a twitch was a, a piece of wood about this long, and it just had a loop of leather on the end. He would take the twitch, and he would grab the horse's upper lip, and he'd put the leather on there, and he'd wrap it around, just holding the upper lip. I was always somewhat astounded and kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to put a, that on my lip. <laughs> and he would twist and he would hold the horse and he, and, he, and he used to say, you know, if you control the lip, you control the mouth. If you control the mouth, you control the neck. If you control the neck, you control the body and you control the horse. And he just said one phrase, that's a lot like life. That's all he said. Now as a kid, I'll be honest with you, I didn't get that. Because I thought, man, that is really cruel. I would not want that done to my lip. Or what he's doing, it's just a, sort of this hard way of doing something. But it was a lesson in life when I look back that if we control our lips, we control our mouth and our neck and our body, and we'll probably words to live by. That is a lot like life. And so many times the things that we've heard or was sort of imparted to us as kids was very, very important. Regardless of what, my father was not a believer until later on in life and did not live a very godly life in many, many, many ways. But as I look back on some of the things that I learned from his, as a father, God still used him in my life in a very powerful way. He taught me things about hard work. He taught me things about, you know, even though when I asked him once that I needed a loan, he said, no. I think you can, you can get that on your own. And I thought, why in the world? He, he, he loaned a whole bunch of money to my twin brother. I'm like, what, what's wrong with that? But he saw in me a need for working harder that I would get there on my own. So as I look back on Father's Day, and I was thinking about my father this morning as I was, you know, jotting down some thoughts. I thought, you know, God can use anybody, and God does use anybody, even our fathers, whether they were good, bad, or indifferent, to help shape us and teach us something. And so I think for many of us, like myself, I didn't have a godly father. I didn't have a, a father that I look back and said, he modeled God the Father in his life. He didn't model teaching me God's word or any of those things. But yet I learned some things from him. So turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 78. 
We're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. And as you turn there, before you get there, I want to uh, I want to preface something that's, that's interesting because I thought about that. You know, one of the things we do with kids, a great thing to do, and many of you may have memories when you were a child of your father reading to you. Maybe he read a book to you before you went to bed. Maybe it's your mother a lot, but many times, you know, we may have read to our kids. And I think about what are the books that we sometimes think about reading. So I, I went up to my office and I just grabbed some books that I know that we tend to go through with kids. Here's one, Bambi Grows Up. Great life lessons are learned about Bambi. I'm not bashing Bambi, don't get me wrong. Elmo's Animal Alphabet. Here's one, Clifford Grows Up. Clifford the Big Red Dog, we all love that, right? Spot's Birthday Party, an old classic. Barney and Baby Bob go to the grocery store. <laughs> Missed I miss that. The Icky Bug Alphabet Book. Another favorite here, Five Little Monkey Monkeys with Nothing to Do. And then there's always some of the classic Dis Disney's Beauty and the Beast. And if you go back and you think about all the books that were read to you by your Father, what were they? What were some of those books? Were they some of those stories? Any any favorite books as a kid? Call of the Wild. Call of the Wild. Anything else? Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Yes. Somebody read Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8, nice and loud, if you would. Listen, all my people, to my instruction, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and a given to law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. That the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. Through eight. That they should put their confidence in God not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare the heart and the spirit was not faithful to God. Okay. Now there are a lot of uh, passages in the scriptures about fathers and there are a lot of admonitions to fathers about what to do and how to how to be as fathers and it was interesting I was Charles Spurgeon who was actually teaching a sermon out of actually on Psalm 41 which gives a similar thing about remembering the past and he, he was using the example when it comes to children's books or nursery rhymes how our culture has changed because in the days of the Israelites what the fathers would teach their kids, would read to them, were the stories of old. How God had delivered the people out of Egypt and out of slavery. And the stories of the flood and Noah. And people like Abraham and, and Isaac and, and all of those things in the Old Testament. 
That's what they would teach their kids. When you follow that through, even into the New Testament, the, the early church would talk about the things that Christ did, Christ's life and the miracles he performed and the apostles and what went on with them. And that's what they would talk about, the things that God had done. And you move into even further, even the early Puritans would do the same thing. They would try to teach and make sure that children understood the scriptures, the stories of God's word from beginning to end. Somewhere in the middle of that, we sort of lost sight of the importance of imparting to our children God's word, the stories we should be telling them, things we need to make sure that they understand are not just nursery rhymes. And I'm not saying you can't teach nursery rhymes to your children. There are many lessons, valuable lessons about uh, our, how we live morally and how we can care for other people that are taught through nursery rhymes. But the most important thing, and the thing it talks about in this passage of Scripture, is the fact that we're telling the stories that is passed on to the upcoming generations to come. Now, when you look at this, you know, the immediate question that I have when I'm reading this is, how do you do that? Because I think many of us as fathers, we're learning this a little too late. And we just wish that, I mean, I wish that, you know, 25, 26 years ago, I knew as much about this as I know now. Because I think I probably would have done differently even in raising my kids. God's blessed me with three wonderful children who love the Lord, who um, really care about serving him, and I could not be any prouder than my three girls. But I can't take all the credit for that at all. That's by God's grace and a wonderful mother and Cheryl. But yet as we look at this, how do you take this to heart and what do you do with this idea that we understand as fathers, number one, what are we supposed to do? How do we do this the right way? How do you do it the wrong way? <coughs> I think first of all, one of the things that when you read that passage, what, what jumps out to you? Let me ask you that question. What do you see or what maybe phrases come out there that are important? What jumped out at me is don't be like your fathers. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be like your fathers. We're going to get to that in a minute because that's very true. What else? Tell it, to the Tell it to the generations. Because I think if we look at what do we need to do or what do we want to do to change our culture or to the change the generations to come, it's not necessarily going to come through the political realm or something like that. It's going to happen in the family. Here's some statistics. If you want to guarantee that your children will, number one, be five times less likely to commit suicide... 32 times less likely to run away, 20 times less likely to have behavioral disorders, 14 times less likely to commit rape, 9 times less likely to drop out of high school, 10 times less likely to abuse chemical substances, and 9 times less likely to end up in a state-operated institution, it would be based upon the presence of the father in their home. Now, when you read this, this passage, the thing that stuck out to me, that it is not a suggestion. It was not a good idea if you want to have a, an extra special family that you do these things. We are commanded to do these things. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I'll open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. <clears throat> we will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God. So this is not necessarily complicated at all to understand. What needs to happen is we need to be talking about the Lord with our children and not just talking about the Lord. We need to be modeling the Lord to our children each and every day. This is a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's something that we really have to do. And if we don't, we should not be surprised if our children do not turn out the way we would like them to turn out. And that message is to us, we as fathers, because God has established in his order of things that we are supposed to be the priest of the home, the head of the household, the shepherd of the flock, which would be your family. Now, I would immediately say to you, that is not an easy thing to swallow. Because the problem is, we know that we don't do that very well. 
It's not easy. We have failed in that regard. And what do we do with that? Some people say the, the thing we don't understand about fatherhood, it's <clears throat> we have babies without anesthesia. We bring them home, we're, we're told to teach them what we don't really know. And we're instructed to raise them in a way that will honor God and we know our lives don't even do the same. So how do we get there from where we are to where we're supposed to be? And I think that's what, you know, if you look at this passage, what it's trying to say is really that. <clears throat> now, if you look at that, verses 5 through 7, it says, He established a testimony in Jacob, and he appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God. So out of that, practically, what does that mean? It's a great idea, but practically, when I go home today and tomorrow morning, how do I apply this idea? What are the right things to do? First of all, <laughs> you got to talk to your kids. Now, men by nature are lousy communicators. Verbally, I should say. <laughs> we communicate. <laughs> it's not always good, but we're lousy communicators. When it comes to verbally, what we, what we say or don't say, really. And so we're instructed, it says, to tell them to your children. It is not the mother's responsibility only to tell everybody about the Lord or to raise them up. They share in that responsibility. Parents should be working cooperatively to that end. But we need to talk to our children, yes. Mothers have taken the job of the father. Mm -hmm. Because the fathers have to work. Yes. That's right. Let me read you this quote along the same line. Sometimes fathers can be pretty hard on themselves, feeling that they have not done the job they should have done with their children. Sometimes fathers give so much energy to their profession and job that they have very little energy left for their children. Sometimes fathers wait until it's too late before realizing how quickly their children are growing up. Sometimes fathers try to give their children things when what the children really want is them. Sometimes a father doesn't try as hard as he could because he sees his wife doing such a wonderful job with her children without more effort from him. And so that's not an excuse, but that's a reality in our culture that many times we relinquish that. I think as men and as fathers, we just need to get in the habit of just talking to them about these things. Now, it doesn't say in the scriptures here, come up with these new revelations that God is telling you, that he gives you this whole thing that you need to lay out to your kids, a three-point sermon about life or what to do in certain circumstances. All he says is tell them what God's done. You just got to tell them what God's done. And not necessarily even to you. Tell them what happened in the days of old. He's talking about, you know, um, there's, there's Jacob and a point of law in Israel. The things that have happened that allow us to be a part of this thing we call the Christian community. Just talk about the Lord. Talk about what God's doing. Isn't that pretty good? Because we make it too hard. Because we just think that we have to come up with something profound or we shouldn't say anything at all. So we keep our mouth shut and that's really profound. I think it's interesting because if you go to this word that this comes from when it says to teach your children, it is not only teach them by telling them verbally. It says to tell them, but also to teach them. And teaching them is exactly that. It's by example. As I, as I mentioned, my own father for many years, most of what I remember about my father, what I learned, I learned by working alongside of him or with him or something he was telling us to do. So it was actually working out, living the life of hard work that I learned some of those lessons. And the same is very true. If we want to really impart something to our children, not only talk to them, but live with them, teach them, show them, just by example, just how you live, because that's what you want them to remember. 
I think the one thing that we fail the most in, because, you know, we, we again, fathers, we, we have all these things that go through our head because we're supposed to raise them right, we're supposed to correct them, we're supposed to direct them, we're supposed to provide for them, all this list of the things we're supposed to do, that many times our approach or how we come across is not necessarily positive. It tends to be punitive or directive or authoritarian. And so, so much of what they're hearing is just being told all of these things. What they really need is what it says in the, that first part of verse 7. So that they should set their hope in God. If you can instill hope in your children, you've accomplished great things. Because hope doesn't come automatically. It comes through something. Yes. Yes. But it broke his heart later on. That's right. So this whole thing about hope, I think, is, is a much greater concept. There's a whole sermon in and of that, in and of itself. And the fact that if you can instill, you can give your kids hope about the future, about what's going on, then you will have accomplished great things. But how do you do that? Do you give them false hope? Because, you know, turn on the television. Oh, my gosh. Is that a very hopeful scene we're looking at? world's going crazy. We talk about that every week. Something else is happening between some political scandal or something going on somewhere else in the world or all that's happening. How are they supposed to have hope? Only ways to die. Only ways. Right? That they should set their hope in God. You got to tell them all the time, God has a plan for you. You got to remind them all the time. Even though you don't see what's going on, you have to trust the Lord because our hope is only in him and what we, what we have to come. He's in control. We, that should be our constant, constant thing coming out of our mouth because it is in that not only just being positive but truly trying to instill hope in them that gives them security. Because when there is no hope, people, people just, you know, that's when those things like anxiety and depression and all those things just rush in like a flood because we don't know where to look or what to look for. Now, the second question is, that's the, this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to talk to them. We're supposed to model this. We're supposed to instill hope in them. That's what it says. But then, as Alan, you just said a minute ago, we tend to focus a little more on this second part and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments in verse 8. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. You want to know what to do as a father? We just said that. You want to know what not to do? Right there. Very simple. What not to do. So what does that look like practically? That they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. <laughs> Men by nature, unfortunately, tend to be a little stubborn. Women, you might agree, maybe you'll disagree. Um, probably not. But we tend to be stubborn just in our thinking because we know what's the right thing to do. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna lead people and come along follow us because that's the way it is. So stubbornness is something that comes very easy to us. Are we rebellious? I don't know necessarily, are we naturally rebellious? Our sin nature would say we're naturally rebellious, but sometimes that rebelliousness is, means, is just about we want to do what's right for us, what we think is the right thing to do. All the, all the rebellions that have gone on in the scriptures throughout history has been not only just about what's a good cause, just because somebody didn't like the way things were. So sometimes if we get caught up in that, even as fathers, if we're stubborn about our thinking, which is not humble, if we're rebellious and we're going to do what we think is right for us, period, all of a sudden, we're leading, not God. And it's very easy to go off the rails right there. What else does it say? That they should not be like their father, stubborn and rebellious, a generation whose heart was not steadfast. You know, I would say that, that when, you, when it says whose heart was not steadfast, what do you think that says? Hmm? Oh, mine says loyal. Loyal. Says unfaithful. Unfaithful. Wishy washy. <laughs> Wishy washy. It was not steadfast. I would determine this as distracted. Sometimes when you're not steadfast, it means you're not you're not pursuing something with all of your energy. 
You're not steadfast. You're not working at it with persevering in the same way. Same word is sort of used. One of the biggest problems we see in fathers in the culture today is that we are distracted. Let me tell you, that's my family. I've always got a hundred things going on in my head. And so I'm not always there. I may be in the room, but I'm not always there because I'm distracted. I'm distracted by other things, by all the other things I have to do. And all of a sudden, I wake up and my kid's 25 years old or my kid's 12 years old or whatever. And so I think that lesson there is very true for us as fathers is we need to be careful on our kids that we're not just distracted with everything else or losing sight of what we need to be doing. And the last one says, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Yeah, kids are smart. They watch us. They listen to us. And they know whether our faith is real or not. They know whether we're really faithful to God. And usually what's interesting is they learn it in the crucible. When the going gets tough is when you really determine where somebody's faith really is. And in the midst of that, if we remain faithful to God, if kids see that our lives are about the Lord, if we're spending time in God's word, if we're trying to live according to his statutes, then if we do that, we will not be the fathers of talking about he doesn't want us to be. You say, Dan, these are just, you know, they're very general, very simple, but it really is. Because I think too often we try to, to put together all these specific things. We need to do these three things, these four things. There's dozens and dozens of books written about fatherhood. But the reality is it all boils down to we can't do this in and of ourselves. We will fail every single time. Now, again, these things in context of this passage about fathers, when we look at the reality for many of us, your father was probably not like that really godly man, just what you were saying. Was, you know, my, I look back and my father was, you know, although a very hardworking man, was, was an alcoholic, was unfaithful and ended up leaving us and just went through, you know, it was a very difficult time when I look back in my childhood when I was in the middle school years and high school years, was left to try to run a small farm with no father there and all of those things. And I look back and it's interesting because what developed in me was a, was a sort of a poor concept of what fathers are really about. And I determined in my mind as a kid, I'm going to be a great father. I'm going to do this differently. But yet in and of myself, I was never going to do that differently. And the Lord sort of taught me a lesson, and I'll share that with you in a minute, but I, I guess I want to preface this, regardless of who you are as a father and your failures as a father, perhaps you don't think maybe you've done as good a job as you can, or maybe you had a father who was as far from an ideal father as it possibly could be, or maybe your father's not here, and that just stirs up a lot of old stuff. We do need to remember that there's only one father, and that's God the Father. And we are only truly the example that we can call to the ideal example of a father is the Father God. And we only get there by being adopted as sons. If you read in Romans 8, 14 and 15, it talks about that. Let me read it to you. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's what we need to focus on because the reality is if this doing it of ourselves and what we use as examples is not going to be great. And I guess the one lesson I want to leave you with is the importance of wherever you are in that relationship with God as well as with your own father that there's some parallels there that you can't escape whether we like it or not, because our, our natural tendency is to write them off. Just to say they were, they were horrible, they mistreated us, and that's just it. And I was like that for a long time. And as that relationship is cultivated between the Father, truly the Father, and we as fathers, we can pass that on. Absolutely. It's the... Right. That to me is great. It's a good sign. We certainly see that trend, but the, the, the question is, there's only one way to get there. 
And that is not about, you know, just doing all these things they tell us, but it's, it's through the Father. But as I was thinking about this, how do you, how do you then get to that place where maybe your, your relationship or the relationship isn't right or wasn't right with your Father? And I think about, well, wait a minute. What did God the Father, Christ is the Son, what are some of the things that the Father said to the Son? Can anybody think of something in the scriptures where the Father, God the Father, talking to the Son Jesus, what did he say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now when you look at the words in the scriptures, that's one of the only times that it's actually said, this is God speaking to everybody else about his Son. This is my beloved Son, the Son I love so much, in whom I am well pleased. Because I think we spend a lot of our time in, you know, in those dialogues about what we say and how we think. Because as I was sharing with you myself, I spent a number of years, was very bitter towards my father because he was lousy. He worked just too hard. He wasn't fair. He, you know, was, lived a very sinful life. So my attitude was very poor. Until one time I was actually at, at a conference and a, and a person told me, he said, listen, if you ever want your, fa- your relationship with your father to be right, you need to deal with yourself, not your father. I said, well, what does that mean? They said, you need to apologize to your father. Oh, 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 wait a minute. I need to apologize to him? You kidding me? I'm not the one who left. I'm not the one who's unfaithful. I'm not the one who all of those things. And I have to apologize to him? He said, yeah. You need to apologize for not recognizing who he was, good, bad, or indifferent. Because otherwise, that bitterness is going to kill you. And so it's interesting because as hard as it was, I went to my father one day and I apologized. I said, listen, I, I, this is going to sound very weird because we didn't have that kind of dialogue at that time. I really need to apologize for not recognizing you were doing the best job you could. Regardless of how it turned out, you were doing the best job you could, and I didn't give you credit for that. And I'm sorry, I was a lousy son in that. And he stood there, and he looked at me, and he said, okay. I turned around and left. That's all I could do. But what's interesting is what happens after that. Because through the process of that, God freed me of all these feelings of what I thought a father should be and what I thought all this. And the only father I could really use an example was God the Father. And I can say looking back on my life with my father, we, I wouldn't say he was a father that modeled God to me. He became my friend. My father came to know the Lord late in life. And we had some great conversations in our last few years before he died was, was really good. And so that idea about the fact that maybe our speaking to our fathers or even about our fathers, if if it's in a time when we pray, maybe needs to be more about affirmation than indignation. Maybe it needs to be more about, Lord, (laughs) as bad as it was, I'm here because of that person, because of you. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, as fathers, we need to do the same thing with our kids. We need to affirm them, let them know we love them, and we're really pleased with them, whether they're perfect or not, whether they're successful or not, whether they're, you know, in not a good place or not, doesn't matter. The father said to Christ, man, this is the one I love, I'm so pleased with. He hadn't done anything yet. Remember, when, when, when the Father was saying this to Jesus, he hadn't healed anybody. He hadn't performed all kinds of miracles. It was just when he was baptized. That's when he opens up and says, listen, I'm so pleased with him. So it wasn't, he wasn't saying, I'm pleased because of all the accolades that Christ had accomplished. I just love him because of who he is. And for me, if I can be that kind of father to my kids, that I love them just because of who they are, regardless of what they accomplish, and be pleased with them, because of who they are, regardless of what they're accomplished, then you know what? They feel affirmed, and I'm free. Because that is how I model being God the Father to being the father of my kids. So, easy to do? No. My kids can tell you, a lot more comes out of my mouth that is not affirming than is affirming. But today on Father's Day, that's what I want to try to do differently. 
as be a lot more affirming in my kids and not more, a lot more pleased with my kids than I ever have been just because of who they are. Because God deals with us that way. He's looking down at us this morning. Believe it or not, we may not hear it verbally, but he's saying, listen, you know what? These are my kids that I love. And I'm, I'm well pleased because you know what? They're sitting here trying to listen to my word. They're trying to praise me with what they have or what they're able to do. Perfect, no. Good, bad, or indifferent, doesn't matter. Because that's what he wants to do. And that's what we need to live each and every day. So... Fathers, if you're like me, we need to work harder at teaching our kids and living God before our kids. Children, <laughs> we need to be more gracious with our fathers. One other thing I read, and just I'll, I'll close with this. You know, this is, this is ominous in some respects and not easy to do. But, you know, we also need to lighten up. You know, as, as statistics, uh, an adult laughs an average of 15 times a day. Children laugh 400 times a day. Somewhere between, you know, childhood and adulthood, we lost 385 laughs. And we somehow need to find that place again because there is joy in knowing. There is joy in failure. There's joy in the midst of that. And we need to sometimes laugh about our own inconsistencies and our own failures because in the midst of that, we somehow start to look at it differently. <laughs> All right. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you again for the privilege of gathering together. Thank you for just being together and looking at your word. And Lord, we're thankful that we have a Father who loves us, that we are your beloved children because we are adopted as your sons and daughters. We are your children because of our commitment to following you. Lord, let us embrace that. Let us enjoy that. Let us cultivate that relationship in ways we maybe never dynamically did. We certainly want to please you and as you did with Jesus, that you were well pleased by who he was and we just want to live lives that bring honor to you. And Lord, for those of us who are fathers and face the task of trying to, to raise our children, we know we can't do it in and of our own strength, but if we simply... Recall upon the things that you've done and share those. If we simply live lives in a way that brings honor to you, if we simply put our minds and our hope in you, then you accomplish great things. Then it will go forth into the next generation and after that and after that. It is only when we become stubborn and rebellious in our own thinking that we know what to do or we fail to follow your statutes or we just get distracted that we lose sight of it and all of a sudden we find ourselves in a place that seems to be so far away, too little, too late. But Lord, there's nothing that's too late with you. There's nothing that's too little with you. You can restore what the locusts have eaten and that's what your word says and I pray you do that in our families, in our lives, in every way. Lord, today as we celebrate this day for fathers, let us think fondly on who you are and that most of all but also in our own lives that we remember that we're here by a father you placed in a way that we don't understand but you still accomplish something in that bring comfort to those who are struggling today because they lost a father that's not easy we know you know that as well Lord continue to bind us together continue to grow us deeper and in whatever ways you choose to grow us and thank you for who you are in Christ's name Amen go back to the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me. No, I won't go back. I won't go back. I can't go back to the